the passage we chanted just now on blessings and protection is something that people like to have chanted at their homes as a blessing for the house. Blessing on their birthdays. The irony is that many times when people ask for a blessing like that, they don't want to hear about aging, illness, and death. And yet the passage itself says one of the protections you have, one of the ways of blessing yourself, is to be heedful. You realize there are dangers in the world. That other passage we chanted, the five reflections, sometimes makes you think that this is what the Buddha was thinking about as he left home. He saw that he was subject to aging, illness, and death, that all that he loved was going to be taken away from him. And at that point, the fifth reflection was not yet confirmed. He had faith that maybe it would be possible through human effort to find a way to go beyond aging, illness, and death, beyond separation. As he said, his quest was this quest for what was skillful, what kind of actions would be skillful in that direction. And then when he came to his awakening, he confirmed the fact that, yes, it is possible through our efforts to find something that doesn't age, doesn't grow ill, doesn't die, and where there's no separation at all. Some people think of nirvana as the ultimate separation, but it's not. All samsara. After all, samsara is not a place. Samsara is an activity, and it's an activity by which we bump up against one another. There was one time I mentioned that it was translated as the wandering on, and someone said, well, it's more like the bumbling on. We keep on making mistakes, we have to live with our mistakes, sometimes learning from them, sometimes not. Sometimes remembering the wrong things, like Talleyrand's comment about the Bourbon dynasty. After they'd been thrown out of France in the French Revolution, and then came back in the Restoration. A lot of them wanted to settle old scores. And as he said, they never forgot anything, but they never learned anything. Most of us are that way. But the Buddha found that there is a way out. We stop the wandering on, stop this addiction that we have. And when you stop an addiction, it's not a case that you're separated from a place. You're freed from the bad consequences of that addiction. So that's the path that the Buddha lays out. And as we're on the path, we have to realize that it's our most valuable possession as we go through this dangerous world. Some of the dangers are physical. The main dangers, though, the, the Buddha said, are the people who will try to teach you a wrong view and try to get you to break your precepts. And those kind of people are everywhere. But you have to realize, based on the Buddha's awakening, he saw that it's through our right view and through our virtue that we can guarantee a good future for ourselves and a good future for those who follow our example. So those are the things you hold on to. Of the things he said, you can lose them. And it's not all that serious, but if you lose your right view and you lose your virtue, it's going to be a lot of suffering. These two qualities, he also said, lie at the basis of mindfulness practice. Because when you live a virtuous life, you reflect back on your actions. And there's nothing that you have to recoil from, nothing you have to hide from yourself. And this, of course, makes it easier to remember what you've done in the past. And you reflect back on the times when you weren't virtuous. It doesn't hurt quite so much because you know you've changed your habits now. You can look back at them and learn more from them. And so the mind is not putting up walls. And it searches back in, in its memory 
to figure out what is skillful and what's not in line with right view. And that's the kind of mindfulness that gives you a good solid foundation and gets the mind into concentration. So wherever you go, make sure that you maintain these two qualities, virtue, right view. And the fortunate thing is that nobody can take them away from you. Someone once asked a John Munn, can you separate a person's virtue from his or her mind? He said, no. He said, it's a good thing you can't separate them because otherwise people would steal one another's virtues and leave you deprived. But once you've got virtue, it's really yours. The only way you lose it is if you throw it away yourself. If you allow yourself to be influenced by people who would like to see you for some reason or another, kill or steal or have illicit sex, lie, take intoxicants. Those are the people who are trying to destroy you. But you don't have to be destroyed by them. They can't take your virtue away from you. The same with right view. As long as you hold on to it, nobody can take it from you. So have a strong sense that these are your most valuable possessions. And they carry in their wake other qualities as well. As the Buddha said, one of the qualities of right view, or one of the corollaries of right view, is wanting to have goodwill for all. He said one time that having ill will for anyone, seeing that ill will would be a good thing to have, would be wrong view. It's in this way that right view underlies your virtue, as you realize that you don't want to harm anybody. You want to do, you don't want to do or say or th think anything that would cause any harm. And that strengthens your virtue. So make sure that you hold on to these things. The Buddha also gives other lists of treasures that you can maintain, include the discernment of right view and virtue, but also other qualities that maintain these two. Things like conviction, a sense of shame, a sense of compunction, learning and generosity. The sense of conviction, of course, is convinced that the Buddha really did awaken to the truth. And he taught it in such a way that we can put it into practice. He wasn't engaged in devious or complicated ways of explaining things that were unnecessarily obscure. As he admitted, there are some aspects of the way the mind works which are very complicated. But he was able to draw out of them the basic principle that if you act on good intentions, the results will be good in the long term. If you act on unskillful intentions, they'll be bad in the long term. So you're going to hold to that. That's for shame and compunction. Shame here is not the opposite of pride or self-esteem. It's the opposite of shamelessness, where you don't really care what other people think. In particular, you don't care what the noble ones think. As the Buddha saw in his awakening, if you give credence to people who are not noble in their opinions, it can lead you to do unskillful things. So you keep in mind those who are noble, and you want to look good in their eyes. It's one of the ways the Buddha says that you maintain yourself in the practice. He calls it the world as a governing principle, loka tipataya. You think there are people in the world who can read minds. What would they think if they're reading my mind when I'm thinking of giving up on the practice? You'd be ashamed to hold on to those thoughts. Now you realize that their concern for you is based on compassion. They're not out there just judging you for the sake of judging you harshly. But they realize if you give up in the path, you're harming yourself, you're harming others. They'd be concerned. And so out of 
a sense of love and conviction for these people, that these are the people who really do mean you well. You want to behave in a good way. The same with compunction. This is more you're seeing for yourself that if you act on unskillful intentions, there's going to be harm down the line. You just don't want to do it. It's your sense of conscience. It's the opposite of apathy. The opposite of callousness. This quality of compunction, this too is a treasure. That's for learning that strengthens your right view. And generosity is a way of showing your goodwill for others, because it can mean generosity not only with material things, but also with your forgiveness, with your knowledge, with your energy, with your time. This quality of generosity is so basic that when the Buddha was going to introduce the Four Noble Truths to anybody, he'd start with generosity. And as he said, a person who's stingy can't even get into the right concentration, much less gain any awakening. So these are all qualities that strengthen you, that will protect you. These are blessings. This is how you bless yourself. There's that tradition of referring to the Buddha as the Blessed One. Someone once asked, well, who blessed him? He blessed himself. He found a way to bring himself true happiness in such a way that it wasn't, he wasn't the only one who benefited. The blessings spread around. In the same way, when you bless yourself with these genuine treasures, these genuine valuables, virtue and right view. You're blessing yourself, and the people around you get blessed as well. We live in a world where there's so much danger. The other day I was swooping around the sala and looked out across the valley. It was one of those days when everything was nice and green and fresh. It looked so peaceful. And then back in the background, there was the noise of the artillery over in the nearby military base. Or like tonight with the helicopters. I remind you that even though we found a peaceful corner here, we live in a world where there are a lot of dangers. But don't see physical danger as the worst. It's the danger of using your <clears throat> losing your true valuables. That's what you've got to watch out for. So be heedful. You've got something good here to maintain that no one can take away from you. Make sure you don't throw it away. And don't allow anybody out there to tell you otherwise. They can tell you, but don't let them have any influence over you. That's where you have to stand firm.